So it's a great uh, honor to be here. And uh, uh, I have uh, recently had my second kid, so it's uh, sort of increases the uh, temptation to pontificate about the future. Uh, so this is uh, the, I will talk about the outcome of that pontification. Uh, actually, this is based on an essay that John Maynard Keynes wrote about 80 years ago called The Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Actually, uh, Keynes' essay was much more economics. I'm going to focus a little more on the broader social science. This is a social science panel. And, uh, and I think Keynes's uh, people disagree somewhat about whether it was a success or failure, but, but I don't think it was a f big success in terms of uh, guessing what was going to happen, and because it's very difficult to uh, make predictions. Uh, but, uh, but it also did not really clarify why he was making the predictions that he was. And uh, so actually, I think uh, making predictions about the future is often most useful for clarifying about past trends and understanding past trends. And that's in that spirit that I'm going to take on this task. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to talk about the 10 trends that I think have shaped the world that we live in. And then I'm going to try to explain why these 10 trends are intimately connected. And then I will explain uh, my view of how they will actually continue. The first one is the rights revolution. And what, I, what do I mean by that is, uh, I'm going to show a couple of pictures just to, to illustrate it. This is just a, a couple of indices of democracy in the world. So the world has become much more democratic. So in terms of political rights or civil rights as we measure them, the world has really been transformed. But I think this is really the tip of the iceberg. The rights revolution, or what I mean by the rights revolution, is really a transformational event. The, live, the world we live in today is entirely different in terms of its respect for individual freedom, in terms of its respect for rights of women, minorities of all sorts, ethnic, religious, gender, and sexual minorities. Only at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, Oscar Wilde was condemned for two years of hard labor in probably the most progressive country at the time for being a homosexual. You know, not the rights of all Sexual minorities are not respected around the world, but we really are at a sea change compared to the world that we lived in about 100 years ago. So this political and social change recognizing more rights is a social change, but is intimately connected to a variety of economic changes. The second, what I call the sweep of technology, is that technological changes have been entirely transformative also. People coined the term the Industrial Revolution for a wave of gadgets and machines that really changed the social and economic lives of people starting in the 18th century, uh, middle of the 18th century in England and spreading to the rest of the world. Even compared to that rapid period of change, our era has been much more rapid and much more radical. It is quite difficult for people in most parts of the, country, of the world, except a few pockets in Africa and perhaps uh, in Asia, to actually imagine the world that our grand-grandparents uh, lived in, in terms of the technologies that we have available. And I'm not just talking about the internet, much more basic things such as indoor plumbing, uh, access to the sorts of chemicals and drugs and communication technologies, the level of lighting and the possibilities of transport and so on and so forth. And following from that technological changes, we've also seen an unrelenting process of economic growth. So what I show in this picture here is the world growth GDP in a log scale. So this is essentially a steady growth of uh, over 2% a year. And the blue and the red lines are for the United Kingdom and the United States, the two countries I picked as sort of the frontier economies. So what's remarkable here is not only the growth process, but how steady it has actually been throughout the 20th century. Big exception, the Great Depression, which was a down and up movement, so it sort of have been largely made up. And as you can see, the growth is actually not only more rapid, but also have, has picked up speed in the second half of the 20th century in the rest of the world. But that fact notwithstanding, this growth has been uneven. I think most people who would have been optimistic about growth at the beginning of the 20th century would have predicted growth to have taken place broadly in the world and in a way that actually reduced the inequities. 
At the time Adam Smith was writing The Wealth of Nations, the gap between the richest and the poorest countries was probably of the order of about four to five fold. Today, if you look at the richest to poorest countries, it's over 60 fold. Here what I show is actually richest to poorest is a sort of a uh, volatile statistic. So instead what I show is a uh, the, the ratio of the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. And regardless of whether you weight it by population so that you give more weight to India or China, inequality at the world at the national level has been increasing. It's been increasing tremendously as you can see from that black figure there. The fifth trend is a transformation of work. Associated with the technological changes, the nature of work has changed also. One of those is very well known. Agricultural work has declined quite dramatically in most countries around the world. But perhaps equally momentous is another aspect of transformation of work that has been associated with the automation of a variety of production and non-production tasks. And to illustrate that and that how widespread that is, at least for in a bunch of countries, what I've done here is I've put here, uh, I've put four groups of occupations that are fairly large occupations. Production tasks, clerical tasks, and service occupation, and engineering and management type occupations. And as you can see through a variety of them, I just picked these countries not uh, at random, this pattern is pretty much true for all OECD economies. Production tasks have been declining, clerical tasks have been declining, and service tasks and uh, and, uh, and managerial engineering design tasks have been increasing. This is in inherently related to the nature of technological changes of the last half century, which have routinized a lot of production tasks and also a lot of clerical tasks uh, and, 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 and have enabled machines to perform these tasks much more efficiently. An implication of these, at least in the United States, has been distributional. This is a remarkable picture. Some of you may have seen it, but for those of you who haven't seen it, take a moment to observe this. This is the US wage distribution. The middle, the blue line, is the median US wages, real, deflated by the CPI. The red one is the 90th percentile, and the red one is the 10th percentile. So a couple of things here. First of all, from 1970 onwards, there have been almost no growth in US median wages. Second there has been a huge increase in the top inequality. And I, I'm going to show what, what I mean by top even more. But here you can see that with the gap between the 90th and the 50th percentile. There has been an increase in the, in the gap between the 50th and the 10th percentile, but it's dwarfed by what's been happening by the, between the 90th and the 50th percentile. And here is a different way of seeing it. This is the uh, distribution of wages uh, the ratio of different wage percentiles to the 90th. And as you can see, this is essentially the hollowing out of the wage distribution. The middle is sort of disappearing. Okay? Uh, let me skip this, but let me just show you this one, which is also in a comparative perspective. Uh, this is the top 1% of the US uh, wage distribution. So this is the share of the US GDP that goes to the top 1%. And that has reached huge levels. There are similar trends in some other European countries, but uh, they're much more muted relative to the United States. But the trend is towards greater inequality and greater inequality at the top. Health revolution. The transformative effects of the technologies that we have developed over the last 60, 70 years on health in the world are also difficult to fathom for people who haven't worked, lived through it. Somebody who lived in the United States or the United Kingdom in 1900 would have been twice as rich as somebody who lives in Indonesia or India. But they would have, been, they would have access to much worse health care. They would have had about 15 years lower life expectancy and much good health outcomes in pretty much every respect. And India and Indonesia are not at the top of how well they're do, we're doing in terms of health. And you can see that here, the, uh, the orange line is the, the Asian life expectancy. You're seeing, you see how quickly that is increasing and how quickly it's actually catching up with the, with the, with the more developed world, which is, the, which is the blue line. This technological developments and the economic changes have also been at some level without borders. Our world has become greatly globalized, and international trade is only one aspect of it. Communication and sharing of information and ideas is another aspect. 
But here I have just shown, I'm just uh, showing the international trade aspect. International trade was high at the beginning of the 20th century. It came down, it, it, uh, it, it came crashing down with the, uh, with the Great Depression, but it has reached unparalleled heights today, as you can see from that picture. Another important trend is related to warfare. Any discussion of social trends or any discussion of human trends without mentioning warfare is, will be at best incomplete. And the 20th century has seen an entirely remarkable sets of developments in respect to this. It has been both the century of peace and the century of war. The early part of the 20th century has witnessed the most deadly conflicts in the world. And you can see the international battle that's for the, relative to the entire population drawn there. But since World War II, this has been an unbelievably peaceful century. No other century, and a recent book by Steven Pinker also emphasizes the same thing, no other century for which we have records, and we have quite a lot of records going back to very far, to hunter-gatherer societies, comes even close how peaceful this century has been. This is even true when we look at civil wars, which have, been, which have ravaged many parts of the world, but even civil war deaths have actually come down, and despite some uh, notable and very sad genocides in places such as Rwanda and like the one that's going on in Syria at the moment, uh, this is still comparatively a peaceful century. Homicides have increased a lot in the 1960s. People debate what the reasons for that are, but they have been coming down, this is throughout the world. This is actually a very international pattern. It's not a US pattern. Homicides increase in every OECD country, pretty much every country we have data for, and they've been coming down very rapidly since the 1990s pretty much everywhere except for a few places like uh, Mexico and Colombia, which have their own other sorts of problems. The ninth trend is about what I'm going to call counter-enlightenment in politics. So the rights revolution would have been predicted, perhaps by some people, might have been predicted by the radical enlightenment uh, philosopher like Diderot or Baron Dolbach. But they would have predicted a world in which rational thought would take over everything. The 20th century doesn't look like that. The 20th century, as well as the rights revolution, has many other political movements. Among those at the early parts of the century, of course, we have fascism, Nazism, military, uh, aggressive militarism that were, of course, responsible for the deaths of millions and the war, wars that we have seen, communism. But one that has been quite influential over the last 40 years is the increasing role of religion in politics. This is a very broad trend. We see this in the United States with the rise of fundamentalist Christians. We see this in Israel with the increasing role of religion in society. But we see it particularly, and, uh, and, and the world is paying attention to it, particularly in the Muslim world. So if, through a variety of channels in the Muslim world, religion is playing more and more of a defining role in politics. And I think any discussion of the social trends of the 20th century that doesn't come to grips with this would also be incomplete. And then the 10th one is that we have actually undergone, undergoing a population explosion and we are eating the resources. Now there was a lot of discussion on this, including this uh, famous wa wager between uh, Ehrlich and uh, Simon which uh, was sort of the pessimistic and the optimistic view. That was the year of the wager. They, uh, they, they bet on a, on a bundle of uh, uh, natural resources. And, uh, you know, Simon won that uh, wager because the prices came down, but they have been coming up uh, more recently. So there is an issue of whether we're going to be able to support the growing population and the growing GDP of the world, but I think that's a sideshow. The bigger one is not really that we're going to run out of scarce resources. I think there's a lot of evidence that technological ingenuity will, come, uh, will, will overcome that, but whether we are going to use our non-scarce resources, including coal, which is a non-scarce resource for all practical purposes, to destroy the environment. So this is the CO2 emissions and the CO2 carbon concentration in the, uh, in, 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 uh, in the atmosphere, and as you can see, it has been increasing at an unparalleled uh, speed with, uh, with no impact of the Kyoto Protocol, for example. So the next step is actually to interpret these facts. 
So there, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I'm going to borrow from uh, a book that, uh, that I have worked on for uh, many years with my uh, friend and co-author, uh, James Robinson, called Why Nations Fail. And I'll just tell you a couple of the distinctive features of the framework, which I think will help us uh, give a little bit more of a perspective on what's coming next. The dominant paradigm within social sciences is a sort of technological determinism. So what you might have expected, uh, hearing the sort of trends that I have listed, in particular, several of these trends that are technological in nature, including the, the sweep of technology, the health revolution, the transformation of work, but also, of course, the growth and the unevenness of growth, that the story here would be one where technology has its own dynamics, and those dynamics are shaping and forming the social relations. One example of that, for example, would be the modernization theory uh, associated with uh, uh, Lipset which sort of sees a very strong causal link from increases in income to democratization, and perhaps you can expand that to the rights revolution and so on. The framework that Jim and I offer is a sort of polar opposite of that. We think that technology is indeed at the root of many of the economic and social outcomes that we observe, but technology itself is endogenous, and technology itself is shaped by institutions broadly construed. And those institutions, are the ones that we really have to understand. And that's where the rights revolution comes in. So therefore, the framework that I develop for understanding the 10 trends is that the rights revolution is at the bottom, and all of the rest follow from it. So therefore, we have to just say a few words about where the rights revolution comes from. And I'm really going to just say a few words, because time is short, and, uh, and I don't want to kind of make us even further than 40 minutes straight, late. But the institutions that we live under are not autonomous things with their own dynamics. They are human choices. We choose them. But by we here, I don't mean we as, in, as a collective for the good of the society and so on. They are the result of conflict. They are the result of conflict because institutions are mostly about who controls whom, who wields political power, and how that political power can be used to extract resources from one group for the benefit of another. So for that, what we, the terms that we use in the book are extractive and, uh, and inclusive institutions. And extractive institutions are essentially the norm throughout society. Extractive institutions are those that, that organize the economy such that one group can extract resources from another. And they are supported by political institutions that are also extractive, that concentrate political power in the hands of a few so that the, the extractive economic institutions can be supported. Extractive institutions have no pretension, or they may have a pretension, but really they have no business in encouraging economic growth. Their business is not, their purpose is not to encourage economic growth. Their purpose is mostly distributional. They might generate economic growth, but that's not their main objective. And because they are creating a very lopsided distribution, every now and then they are challenged, but they are challenged by those that have been denied of rights and exploited and treated badly. And that process, in an uncertain and somewhat bumpy manner, leads to the emergence of inclusive institutions. The emergence of inclusive institutions has been slow. It, they have shown up every now and then in places, perhaps a little bit in the Roman Republic, perhaps in Venice. But really, the transformative changes there came with the Glorious Revolution in England in 1688. And there is no surprise, it's no coincidence that the Industrial Revolution started kicking in in England following the Glorious Revolution uh, short, uh, by, by about 60 years. So the inclusive institutions are mostly about the distribution of political power and how the economy is organized. But they don't exist in a vacuum. Any sort of institution has to have a social basis. And that's where the rights revolution comes in. Suppression of all kinds of rights, women's rights, minorities' rights, individual rights, is part and parcel of extractive institutions because their purpose is to keep a particular social order, a lopsided order albeit, but a particular social order. So essentially what you do is that when you start taking shots at extractive institutions and denting its fabric, you're taking the genie out of the bottle. 
And once the genie is out of the bottle, that's when all of the controls over a variety of rights in society, a variety of expressions in society, are also coming tumbling down. So the rights revolution and the associated change to inclusive institutions is the root cause of the technological changes that we have experienced over the last 200 years. Once you have those technological changes, then the rest of it follows. Why? Because the unrelenting growth is an outcome of these technological changes. Uh, the technological improvements over the last 200 years are the major contributor to the growth experience that we have. Why, is, how, why has growth been uneven? It's been uneven precisely because these inclusive institutions have spread to some parts of the world, but not to others, which are the parts that have not grown and have, are at the bottom of that increasing inequality across nations. Well, there are places in Africa, South Asia, Latin America that have not, until very recently or not at all, taken a more inclusive turn in their institutions. What about the transformation of work and wages? Well, that's very much related to the technological ingenuity, because this next frontier of profitable technological improvements, which will take place when the rights revolution and the inclusive institutions have allowed, uh, provide the incentives for it, has been the automation of work. And that's the thing that has under, uh, underpinned the transformation of work of wages. The health revolution is actually a very interesting one, because it is actually the intersection of the rights revolution and, uh, and the te uh, technological changes that we are under, uh, uh, that, that I have already mentioned. The first thing to note is that that huge increase in life expectancy came from new drugs, new chemicals, new ways of dealing with diseases. Antibiotics, most importantly, but also uh, things like dealing with uh, malaria, with DDT, and better vaccination, and so on and so forth. But the most notable thing is that the rights revolution is very important here, because that technology did not get transferred to the developing nations in a vacuum. It was actually the actions of a lot of people who felt that rights and better living conditions and healthy living conditions should not just be available to their own countrymen, but to all to around the world, in particular under the banner of the WHO, that actually led these technologies to the rest of the world, that led to the huge improvements in life expectancy in places such as uh, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on and so forth. Well, what about uh, technology without borders? Well, that follows a lot from the communication technology that I've mentioned. The, I think the more challenging ones for us to think about, and, 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 and since I'm running out of time, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about those, are the century of peace and century of war, and the counter-enlightenment in politics. And I think the best way to understand all of these is that the path from extractive institutions to inclusive institutions and all of that rights revolution is not a peaceful process whatsoever. It has to be conflictual because you are upending a set of institutions that generate wealth and power for a narrow segment of society and replacing them by something to totally different. And not only the people who benefit from them, but the entire social fabric on which they were built is going to react to those changes. So I think uh, uh, it is very difficult to understand movements such as fascism, for example, without understanding those sorts of conflicts that have uh, emerged. So, uh, and let me not say much more about the population explanation and the environment at this point. Let me end by saying it two, for two minutes, since again, I don't want to take more time. So what can we say about how these trends will continue or whether they will continue at all? And I think since I have already painted a framework in which the rights revolution is at the bottom, really most of it depends on the rights revolution. So the, the question you should be asking yourself is, in 100 years time, when it's our grand children's world, will they be living in a world that has as much respect, more respect, or less respect for individual freedoms, for sexual, ethnic, religious minorities than we do? And the, the answer to that question is not obvious at all. Nevertheless, on balance, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. The first reason is that all sorts of institutions, extractive institutions and inclusive institutions included, create their own feedback loops. So once inc inclusive institutions are in place, they are resistant to go, uh, movements that will take those rights back. And we can see that in several ex uh, uh, historical examples, for example, from the US or Europe, where there have been attempts to change institutions back, and they have often been resisted. Perhaps we are in the midst of another one, 
related to the increase in inequality, related to some erosion in civil liberties in the United States at the moment. But I think, on the whole, the power of inclusive institutions are generally strong. There are other threats to the rights revolution, alternative growth trajectories, for example, from an authoritarian growth path from China and so on. But those will be ultimately fleeting and, uh, and not really uh, change the direction of the rights revolution. This is not to mean to say that it's sort of a uh, weak version of history where everything will necessarily go towards the better and at a rapid pace. First of all, the rights revolution will proceed slowly as it has done in the 20th century. Yes, we have many, many more rights, but there are still many countries in the world where individual freedoms are seriously constrained and uh, curtailed. And that will continue to be so. But once the rights revolution is in place, and if it doesn't get reversed, I think the rest will more or less follow. Technology, you know, I don't think we are running out of ideas. There are some books that argue recently that we, we picked the low-hanging fruit and we are now going to run, of, run out of ideas. Actually, uh, a lot of historical and, and, and other evidence shows that there is great possibility, there is great plasticity to technology. Technology changed, uh, can change where it's directed to, and that generates a lot of opportunities for technology to continue. So unless the foundations, the institutional foundations of the technological change uh, are destroyed, technology should continue. If technology continues, then growth should continue. Will it continue to be uneven? Undoubtedly, it will be uneven, but we expect it to be much more even than it was before. Why? Well, because the next frontier for the rights revolution and the inclusive institutions are the places which have extractive institutions. As those inclusive institutions actually spread to the rest of the world, as we are seeing, for example, with India and places, uh, the growth is going to start spreading. So we're going to have growth come much more from the places that missed out the first wave of growth in the 19th century and the 20th century, and therefore the growth process is going to be more equalizing. Again, what we know about the engineering and the science of it suggests that the transformation of work and wages is going to continue. The big robotic improvements are going to be in the future. And that, as a result of it, it's going to, uh, it's going to continue the same process. Now, that raises some important issues that intersect with the rights revolution. Because unless appropriate policy actions are taken, many of these technologies might contribute to the growing inequality that I showed you. But that's where the comparative perspective that was kind of glimpsing uh, in, in what I showed is important. Because there is nothing inevitable about greater inequality following from these technologies. They do create a tendency for greater inequality. But that's where the inter international picture is useful. Because many other countries that have been subject to these same trends have had much lower increases in inequality, much, uh, much less increase in inequality than the United States. So I think one way of uh, one important frontier for uh, societies will be how to manage this change in the uh, automation of work that reduces demand for many low skill, medium skill occupations. But I think that's something that's feasible. The health revolution, there are better people to talk about that and, 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 and all of that. And I think the only, the, the one that I want to sort of uh, uh, end by saying two, uh, uh, two more things is the counter, counter, uh, counter enlightenment in politics and the population explosion and, and resources and the environment. On the counter enlightenment on pol in politics, I think. The move from extractive to inclusive institutions and the move towards rights revolution is not an easy one. It will create more bumps on the road. It will create more conflicts. It will create more backlashes. But nevertheless, I think uh, I remain generally optimistic. I think the, most, uh, the greatest ground for optimism comes from the Arab Spring. So some of you might think, actually, that the Arab Spring has already kind of disappointed many. Because all of that youthful enthusiasm that really stood for more liberal values has been replaced either the military rule uh, in, in Egypt or uh, led to the sort of carnage we see in Syria, or it has led to establishment parties such as Muslim Brotherhood coming to power. But actually, I think that's the more pessimistic, that's, that's, a, that's an overly pessimistic read of the situation. I think the first is that even though uh, some of the existing elites are trying, trying to recreate the, uh, the, the old system as in Egypt, the changes, are, uh, the, the, again, I'm going to repeat the same word as I said, the genie is out of the bottle. The, when the military rule steps out of bounds, as they often do, people are again filling Tahrir Square. 
I think people have realized that they actually have more power than they previously knew. And that is a very important step towards inclusive institutions and towards the rights revolution. So what about, play, uh, what about kind of parties like Anada or the Muslim Brotherhood? The fact that uh, have, they've come to power and the fact that, for example, they're not sympathetic to, uh, for example, <clears throat> rights of sexual minorities, does that mean that the rights revolution is going to take a big step back? And I think the, uh, the answer is probably no. I think in the short run, these parties are not going to be the greatest harboringer of uh, rights for all minority groups. But at the end of the day, they are really speaking for a significant fraction of the population that was entirely disenfranchised before. And again, this, I'm going to repeat exactly the same sentence again. The genie is out of the bottle. It doesn't really matter whether it comes in the form of Muslim Brotherhood or the Anada. Once you start bringing down the edifice that supported these very highly authoritarian structures, inevitably, the more will follow. So there will not be any explicit, easy recognition of uh, religious minorities' rights or sexual minorities' rights in Egypt anytime soon. But de facto, the trend is going to be towards greater rights recognition. And then the final thing I want to say is the environment. What can we do about the environment? Are we just going to keep on increasing our GDP and as a result uh, pumping more carbon into the atmosphere? And the answer is yes, perhaps. But again, there are two reasons to be optimistic. One is technology, the other one is the rights revolution. Technology is because if we're going to have any solution to global warming, it has to be technological, because neither China nor the United States nor India nor Brazil uh, is going to cut their production in order to reduce carbon. But again, our technological ingenuity is very important here. The second one is the rights revolution, because in the rights revolution is the notion that we also should care about the welfare of others. So as we care about the welfare of others, that creates an environment in which multilateral negotiations to deal with such situations is going to be more feasible. And we can see that already in many countries where people do make sacrifices in order to be more, uh, more green in their choices. And I think that is, again, the most important step for thinking about our optimism for the future. Mr. Deputy Minister, Mr. Ambassador, dear friends, dear Daron, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here. And if some of you think that after Daron's presentation, I will tell you what I think the exchange rate between the Turkish lira and the euro is going to be in August, <laughs> or uh, you know whether Greece will be in the eurozone uh, by December, you're wrong. Because I'm going to also take a somewhat uh, longer view. And in fact, I'm quite happy we spoke briefly uh, with Daron, uh, and, and our, our, I think our presentations are quite complementary. By the way, Mr. Ambassador Tan, you sent, I hope there will be a Nobel Prize winner, and I think one of our front runners is right here, so we're, we're all. <laughs> so let me pick up from, from him, and in fact, some of the trends he, he projected are very much the ones I also have in mind. But I would say, that uh, the 20th century in many ways ended in 1990, 10 years early. One major event, of course, was the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And although I've always been a committed social democrat, I do believe in the market economy. And I think the fact that after the collapse of the uh, centrally planned Soviet system, the whole world became a much more global economy a kind of unification with many diversities, many changes in different countries, but nonetheless, a freer world and a, and a, and a more market-oriented uh, world, I think was one big watershed change. And as you know, Francis Fukuyama, who's now at Stanford, uh, kind of termed it the end of history, and I'll come, I'll come back to that. But there was a second thing that happened around that time, not as dramatic at, the, at that point, but I think with an equal importance, if not larger importance, and that is we entered actually an age of convergence, economic convergence. And here, uh, Daron said there's been an increase in inequality globally. But I think the inequality he was referring to is the inequality between the poorest nations and the richest nations. And indeed, if you look at the Madison numbers, and he said four to five, uh, referring to some other numbers, but the numbers I've got, if you take the 10 
poorest regions in the world in the eight, in 1800 and compare it to the 10 richest regions, and I'm saying regions because borders change, the ratio was three to one. And that ratio is now 50, 60 to one. So obviously, as Daron said, between the poorest countries and the very richest countries, the gap has continued to increase until very recently. There may be some change in the last 10 years. So there was grand divergence. But this divergence was not only a divergence between the poorest and the richest until about the middle of the 20th century, but also really between all developing countries and what we now call emerging countries and the richest countries. But in the late 80s, beginning 90s, we see that that trend changes. And I would say we have entered a, an age of convergence with some divergence left at the bottom tail, but with the mass of people in India, in China, in, parts, in many other parts of Asia, in many other parts of Latin America, actually, in per capita terms, having a growth rate that is now two to three times as fast as the growth rate in the advanced economies. And that is historical. In a way, perhaps, you know, going even longer term, the 19th and the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century will maybe look even like a parenthesis in history, where there was the very advanced, the very rich, and the rest. The rest is catching up in an uneven way, but it is catching up. Uh, the, the per capita growth rate of the emerging and developing countries in the latest IMF projections is about three times as fast, three and a half times as fast as the per capita income in the advanced countries. So I think this is one, uh, one, one, one very important change. Now, you know, it's very risky to make medium to long term projections, but I think this trend will continue. How fast? I don't know. Will it be twice as fast, three times as fast? May it even be four times as fast if the advanced countries cannot overcome some of their current macro problems? I don't know. But it will be a lot faster, and the world of Daron's grandchild, or maybe grand-grandchild, will be a world where, in fact, the distance between average country per capita incomes will be much smaller. I think this convergence is indeed driven by two big interrelated things, and again, I, I, I agree with the thrust of what he said, by technological change and by institutions, and institutions uh, that have gone in the direction of more freedom and more inclusiveness, although, again, that is quite uneven. It is only those kinds of institutions that are able not only to generate the technological progress, but also to absorb and adapt it, which then leads to the productivity convergence, which we've uh, which we've uh, witnessed over the last two decades and which is accelerating and consolidating itself. So uh, I think the debate, is it institutions, is it technology, is perhaps a little bit of a false debate. It is technology and institutions. And in many ways, I would guess that one can even define technology under the heading of an institution. Uh, you know, the, the knowing how to do things, how to advance, how to adapt things is very much part of technological development. Of course, the information revolution has made the spread of knowledge and the spread of know-how and technology much more rapid. So you can pick up ideas. And one of the key reasons why the developing and the emerging countries are growing a lot faster now is that they do not have to invent from scratch. They can adapt, but they can actually use what is there in Japan, in the US, in Germany, uh, in Sweden, and adapt it to their own circumstances. And that is easier and quicker than if you have to develop the research and, and, and development and invest to develop completely new technologies. So there's a catch-up element in the growth. And there are quite a few theories, which I think are reasonable, that said that the further you are aware from the best practice frontier, the greater is your capacity to catch up if you have the political and socioeconomic system and the institutions that allow you to have that catch up. Until the late 80s, many of the developing and, and emerging countries really didn't have that institutional setup. They were not able. The technology was there, out there. But because of clo the closure of their borders, the lack of sufficient trade, the lack of sufficient foreign investment, the lack of democracy and freedom and in innovativeness, um, the, the lack of sufficiently good academic institutions, that catch-up growth, that catch-up 
uh, that importation of technology was taking much more time or wasn't taking place at all. Nowadays, it is taking place. There is one point I'd like to add here. There is a little bit of an Asian difference. Uh, the higher your savings rate is, the more you can invest with your own resources without being dependent on too much foreign resources, the faster you can import that technology, the faster you can convert it into physical and human capital, and the more rapid you can grow. And I think when we say developing and emerging market countries, we see a very significant difference between the Asian savings rate, with China being the extreme, with 50% savings, which is completely outlier, you know, and the Latin American countries, the Mediterranean countries, and I'm afraid, unfortunately, I have to say Turkey also, which fits more the Latin American Mediterranean model rather than the Asian model. I think Turkey is in this convergence phase, is absorbing technology extremely rapidly. It has basically, with some weaknesses, but basically the institutions that allow rapid convergence. It is geographically well located. It has deep links with the advanced economies such as Germany and, and also the US. So all these things are very positive and make the potential for Turkish growth very fast. However, it has a national savings rate that moves around 16 and 12% compared to Asian rates which move between 30, 40, and even up to 50%. And so in order to invest sufficiently, 23, 24% of its GDP, it imports a lot of capital, it has a large current account deficit, and even that investment rate is nowhere close to the Asian rate. So we do in Turkey, I mean in terms of accelerating and sustaining our rapid growth, I think we do have a savings problem. I think we can overcome it. India is a very interesting example. India started 15 years ago with a savings rate in the low 20s and now has a savings rate of 35% of GDP. So it is not true that you know, your savings rate is fixed forever. But I would suggest, just you know, since we are here among many uh, Turkish Americans and Turks, that the biggest challenge for Turkey, if it wants to really realize and sustain because it has realized very rapid growth, but then there's always one year you know, negative growth that kind of draws down the average. If it wants to sustain the rapid growth, there is need to raise the national savings rate. I don't have time to go into that, but I think, uh, I, I think this is one of our national challenges. If we succeed with that, I think the kind of growth rates we can sustain are of Asian nature, but that is one of our challenges. So in a way, the convergence is a happy fact. I don't think any of us likes a world divided between the super rich and the poor, the super powerful and the not powerful. The fact that there is now this convergence, I think is a, is a very positive factor and I agree again with many of the things uh, Daron said. The fact that Turkey is also converging and in a way is geographically at a point when it, where it, it can lead the convergence maybe of a whole region, again, is a, is, a, is a very happy event. But there are four problems that I want to emphasize that um, make me worry and uh, you know that that are dangers or threats maybe to to the smooth unfolding of the future and the happy lives of I have also a grandchild I have a grandchild <laughs> of two and a half years old uh, which whom I'm uh, so you know for, for the happiness of that grandchild and the grandchildren that are coming the first and it's very relevant to the debate in the US this economic convergence means that 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, we will have more equal power in the world. The super rich countries, the super advanced countries cannot maintain the monopoly of power and of influence that they've had over the last 100 and 150 years. This does not mean that they have to become impoverished. In fact, the long-term, kind of roughly 2% growth rate that Daron showed you can continue in the US, in Europe, and in Japan, in my view. In other words, the living standards, not that GDP is a perfect measure, but you know, we, we can't say everything in a half-hour lecture. Uh, 
But the living standards in the US, in Europe, in Japan can continue to increase. People can be more prosperous, slowly, not at the rate of an increase that we see in China or in Turkey or in India or hopefully in Brazil and Mexico. But it's not a zero-sum game. The advanced countries can continue to prosper. Indeed, in my view, the faster is the growth in the emerging markets and the better is the growth worldwide, the faster will be their own growth with more demand, more dynam dynamism. However, their relative position will change. And that is of, will require a very deep psychological, political adjustment. It cannot be that the advanced countries insist on their preeminence, their dominance, and almost their monopoly. And that will have many implications. Military, uh, international organizations, who leads them, all kinds of dimensions will have to change. Will the advanced countries, and particularly will the US, adjust from being the sole superpower in alliance with some other advanced countries to a leading, prosperous nation in a more equal world? I think this is a big, big political question. It needs to be debated in the US. Again, I underline, it does not mean that American citizens have to become less well off. On the contrary, they can continue to become more well off. But in relative terms, the Indians, the Turks, the Chinese, and the Brazilians will get closer and will want a bigger share of the overall political influence in the world. Uh, which comes with their increased economic importance. So that's the first big, big question, big debate that needs to take place. The second, and these things are linked, inequality. Daron showed you some pictures. Inequality in the US, and particularly inequality at the very top, in other words, concentration at the very top, is back to where it was in the 1920s. Roughly speaking, depending on which numbers you look at, the share of the 8% richest Americans in 1980 was about 8%. 1% 1 had 8%. Now it, that 1% has more than 20%. And the, 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 the trends, the direction of change is pretty steady with some ups and downs, but continuous. It is not outlandish to think that by 2020, if nothing is done, if nothing is changed, 1% of the richest Americans will have one-third of income in the US, which I think is unsustainable. It, it, there's, there's a problem. Now, I, again, I don't have the time to, to, to go into the problem. I think there may be, there's an ethical problem. There's a political problem. There's a super PAC problem, I would say. <laughs> you know, there are all kinds of problems. But I think there's also a macroeconomic problem. And I don't have time to get into it, but it's a topic I'm working on. Can a capitalist society generate sustainable long-term demand in sufficient amounts if the income concentration keeps moving to the top and the broad middle class is not sharing and getting its share of the overall productivity increase? So it's not just an ethical problem, but I think there may even be a macro policy problem. How long can interest rates be zero and fiscal deficits huge to prop up a demand that otherwise isn't there, isn't sufficiently there. Raghuram Rajan from Chicago has written in a very interesting book along those lines. And that, that very radical revolutionary institution called the IMF of all places has built models showing that increased concentration of income at the top actually generates macroeconomic policy problems. And uh, while in, in other countries the trend is not as strong, it is there. And technically speaking, the Keynesian problem is actually created by changes in the distribution because you adjust to a change. So, so as long as the trend keeps going up, similar problems can appear in other countries. So this has a lot to do, of course, with the first problem. Because if the US income distribution problem isn't solved in the direction of greater equity, then while, the, while overall American income may go up, despite the fact that Chinese, Turkish, and Indian income is growing faster, the average, the median American income may not go up or may even go down. And that then creates a real problem. 
particularly because many politicians will blame that on the Chinese, the Turks, and the Indians, rather than on the income distribution issue in the US. So these two problems, I think, are inti intimately linked. The third issue, again, uh, Daron has referred to it. This growth that is most likely to continue because the drivers are there, the technology is there, the will, to, you know, the, 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 the desire on the part of billions of people to live better is there, the institutions are better. But it uses up natural resources. It uses up oil, it needs energy, it uses up climate protection, or if you like, it increases the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So is there a constraint on this growth, a new constraint, that has to do with nature, basically, and perhaps most importantly, climate. Big debate. We had a wonderful conference in Turkey some years ago, and we invited the head of Greenpeace International. It was an international conference. Uh, the gentleman from Greenpeace was a very well-meaning green, and he said, he started his conference by saying, ladies and gentlemen, let's face it, your grandchildren won't be able to live as well as the grandchildren of the advanced countries because we don't have enough energy. Well, that was not received very well at all in that conference. And I think he's wrong. And I think he's wrong because I do believe that human ingenuity, technology, will create the response to the carbon challenge and the nature challenge. And will come up with ways to grow which will be much less carbon intensive than in the past. So I think technically, at least for a long time, it's feasible. And, in, and you know, after 50 years, the world's population may actually stabilize, so we don't need the kind of growth 50 years from now that we may still need for the next 50 years. So I think the technological answers are possible. I think there are huge uh, possibilities in renewable energy. Solar technology has tremendous potential, and I hope some of the Turkish-American scientists are maybe working on, on solar technology. Um, nuclear is a big question mark. I'm, I, I have mixed feelings about it, but some people claim that nuclear is still a reservoir of clean energy that if one can manage the safety part could, could respond. Although I think some problems are not solved, the, you know, the, the storage problem of, the, uh, of, of what's left over. But I do believe that there, and, and then there's, there's shale gas, although shale gas again has environmental problems and it's not it does generate some greenhouse gas emissions, although much less than coal. Maybe clean coal technology. So there are, there are all kinds of ways that technology, I think, can handle that. However, there are very important policy problems. Ultimately, unless you put a high enough price on carbon, these technologies are not profitable, feasible. It always beats me why Al Gore's proposal some years ago Put a carbon tax, and if you don't want the government to have more taxes, rebate it to lower income people who pay income tax. Don't take a net tax into the government by carbon taxation, but tax the bad thing and give back the good thing. Lower the social security contribution. Lower the taxes that, ta that, that are weight on employment and labor. So there are ways of handling this, I think, with the right kind of policy. But whether these policies will come in time, I think is a big question mark. The, and then that brings me to my final point. Many of the problems we face today, not all, the traffic you know, around here is not a global problem, uh, although the, gas, you know, the emissions may be. Many things have to be handled at the local level. And in fact, in many ways, democracy works best if it's very local. But many of the big problems we face are global. How to end the, you know, the well-known economic problems of how to have a fair system of trade, how to, have, how to regulate the financial sector in a way that it is much more stable. You can do some of it nationally, but if others don't do it, it becomes very inefficient. So there is a global approach that's, that's needed. Health issues, how to control epidemics. These are global issues. Uh, income distribution actually is, is a global issue. Because if you increase taxes on the super rich in your country and other, com other countries don't, they may just go. If you put, you know, people will go to where, where the taxes are lowest. 
So there has to be some balance, some global approach to taxation so that capital cannot find always the, the, the easiest way to avoid taxation. I know you've, you've read about some American corporations, very, uh, well, you know, very well known ones, who have paid zero income tax to the US because they're paying their income tax in the Bahamas, in Ireland, in Luxembourg, and so on and so forth. So again, to have a, a, a more progressive balanced uh, tax system, you need, you need a global approach. Technology will create big challenges, and I, I really am I'm an avid reader of Francis Fukuyama, I must admit. Uh, he's, he's written many, many books, and the latest thing that I read of him was in the Financial Times three days ago. Francis Fukuyama has built his own drone, small drone, and he says, if I can build it, many people can build it. I'm sure some people here, scientists, can, I know how to build drones. And this drone of Francis now can fly over a building, take a picture inside a, you know, a room on the other side of the building, invade the privacy. I mean, not that he wants to do it, but invade the privacy of people, you know, and things like that. And the next generation of drones that people can just build, he says, 20, 30 years from now, may be small little bugs that crawl under your door and take pictures in your, in your, in your bedroom. <laughs> Worse, these bugs may crawl into your bed and inject you with a lethal poison. So you know, when I, when, when I ended uh, that article, I didn't feel very good. <laughs> but it's true. You know, in the field of biotechnology, there are all kinds of techniques now that can be developed to kind of inter, maybe improve or not the human being's capacities. There's a whole danger that, you know, 10 years from now, or no, my, my grandson is two and a half, so 20 years from now, when he tries to apply to university, he may take a bio, biotechnology test, you know, uh, to, to see whether he is highly gifted. Or when he applies for a job, uh, he may be tested in ways that we never hear, heard about. I think all these things are real, and all these things, I think, will need to have international regulation. Countries will have to agree on how to handle these technologies, just as they need now are struggling with nuclear proliferation and nuclear issues. So the space for international cooperation, international coordination of policy, the need to embed our market economies, our capitalism, and our technology into an international community and international politics, I think is going to grow exponentially. And we already see it today. And yet, there is no counterpart to that in our political behavior. Politics is local, national, and people are very upset. When George Papandreou, our neighbor, prime minister at that time, said, look, at the end of the day, I want to ask my people through a referendum whether they actually want to have this policy package to stay in the euro or not. I mean, he was, you know, it, it lasted 24 hours and he was gone. <laughs> the markets didn't have the time to wait for a referendum. But sorry, democracy requires deliberation, debate, information sharing, Markets may have to wait until people can make up their mind, I think, if we want the rights revolution. But markets don't have the time. One push of the button and five billion or 50 billion dollars are gone. Okay? So how are we going to reconcile these markets with governance and with democracy? A question that a colleague of ours, Danny Rodrik, asks in, in, in his book, The, uh, the Paradox of, of Globalization. So I think that's the fourth big challenge. How to embed markets in a much more global politics. I think liberal capitalism was successful in the 20s, 30s, 50s, 60s, because it embedded national markets in national politics and national legitimacy. But as markets has, have now escaped national boundaries and have created a huge global economy which is extremely interdependent with technologies that have tremendous promise but also tremendous dangers. I think the big challenge for the 21st century, uh, one of the, the fourth challenge I wanted to mention here,
is how to embed these markets and this technology in global institutions that uh, people like Ambassador Tan will have to fashion. Thank you very much. Uh, I think one of the reasons that if Asia is doing better, I think they become the global hotspots for the you know, global companies as their um, supply chain management systems. But I think that doesn't help you know, any uh, unemployment, like all that unemployment rate for the global companies. So what I would like to ask you is your opinion on how can these unemployment rates could be brought down from a global economy perspective. <laughs> I think you're the man for that. Well, I, I think, um, you know, with trade, there, there are two things, to, two aspects to the employment, three aspects to the employment problem. <coughs> One is the technology, the robotics, the fact that some of the technology that is being developed is labor saving, okay? And in that sense, uh, it, it, uh, it is a challenge to the labor that used to perform those tasks. I mean, again, I, I, you know, I'm not an econ uh, economic historian like Daron is very much uh, you know, e economist and historian, but it, similar things happened when textile machinery was, was uh, you know, invented and so on. So, uh, some of this labor-saving technology is, is quite dramatic and I think puts a downward pressure on employment in the short run, but at the same time, if there's overall growth, uh, there are other areas where employment will be needed. And I think there is a, there is a kind of need to changing skills and edu education system that facilitates that and that brings uh, jobs to, 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 to areas which, which go with the new technology rather than the old technology. However, in the meantime, there is an adjustment. Some people are actually losing their jobs. And so, in that sense, uh, adjustment assistance and helping these people is part of the problem. You cannot just say, well, sorry, you know, you've lost your job, somebody else will gain it somewhere else, end of story. With the trade side, I mean, you know, it's the old trade economist uh, answer, of course. Imports take away jobs from the country that imports rather than produce, but of course, exports add to jobs. And on, in net terms, I mean, depending on many, many details, trade is not necessarily an, an, an anti-jobs uh, affair. And finally, on, in terms of Asia, I mean, I, the, the way they're becoming hubs is very important, but I do, I do want to come back to my point. A country that saves 35% of its income, as opposed to 15, and invests that income, inherently will create more growth and employment than, than, the, than the second one. And finally, there's a macroeconomic element short-term element to, to, to employment, uh, allowing a deep recession uh, when in fact fiscal and monetary policy should, should be able to, to help overcome that recession as fast as possible. Uh, simply saying that rece recessions are natural phenomena that we have to live with, I think of course is another negative factor when it comes to employment. I should take to the naive question, economic question, we're all physicists, but uh, uh, take this as a naive question from a physicist. You said the growth and the uh, uh, savings. Uh, is there a negative correlation between the growth and savings in the countries like Turkey or any correlation? Well, you know, this is, this is a short term, long term. Of course, in the very short term, when there's a Keynesian problem of not enough demand, people save more that reduces the demand so that there's a short term. But in general, of course, in the long run, in the growth kind of, in the, in the decades and centuries world where both of us have, have tried to share our ideas today, higher savings means a higher capacity to invest and therefore higher growth. And Turkey saves a very small fraction of its income. Turkey, unfortunately, is one of the lowest savers among the emerging market economies. My question is from to both of you because we touched on this issue. I think one of the challenges is controlling the population growth in the world in the long run. And I think Doral pointed out that we see increasing emphasis on the role of religion in many societies, including the US. I guess we have a lot of the Russian imposts in societies like US. I mean how do you see what type of policies or regulations can be put 
they give this better. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I mean, actually, uh, most projections. Uh, I can I mention it? It was actually one of my figures, but I didn't comment on it. Most projections uh, show. Uh, world population stabilizing sometime in the 21st century under a variety of scenarios. So, uh, so I think we are uh, we are definitely not going to be kind of increasing the world population to such an extent that it's, it becomes unsustainable. So, so at the end of the day, there is a school of thought that was very popular about 20, 30 years ago. That population, you know, was was a big problem for developing nations. In fact, there were even policy uh, initiatives that started uh, trying to con contain population growth in, in many countries. It's sort of been largely discredited, uh, both on its effectiveness and on its desirability. So I think, you know, we're not really creating much long-run problem in terms of population, you know, by increasing our population. Uh, you know, in the short run, there might be some political or uh, civil war implications of greater population in places where, for example, water is scarce uh, and, and so on. But, uh, but, but, but I think, uh, you know, in some sense, what I was trying to emphasize is that the, the biggest strain we're gonna, we are putting on the environment is not related to scarce resources, is not related to population per se, but it's related to our carbon emissions, which is largely totally independent from scarce resources. Yeah, you, you put great emphasis on rights movement driving many of the needs. And I think this is a very uplifting projection. It's, it's actually wonderful. But in thinking about that, do you see some tipping points where there will be inherent conflicts between the desire to obtain more rights and at the same time bring you back a conflict with other needs? And the timeline, for example, how what will be the cycle of the rights? Resolving this conflict. I think that's an excellent question, and I just honestly don't know the. Uh, so the, the question is, if indeed uh, there are greater demands for rights, are there subsets of these rights that will come into conflict with each other, and and, and if so, how will it resolve itself? And my answer is that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But, but let me give you one example, which is, you know, for instance, uh, one right that I did not mention here is, uh, is some people would want to have it as a right, is a right to a living wage or right to a certain types of organizations in the workplace. You know, do I believe that's a, that's a right? Well, yes and no. At some level, you know, we would love exactly, as Kemal said, and as my figures show, that we would like a more equitable distribution of income. But, and, and, and it is very important, and it, if you look at the history of the rights revolution, unions organizing uh, was very important for enfranchisement in almost every country, and so that, those are very important. But, but, but if you go very far in that and say, for example, uh, adopt a variety of close shopping arrangements in unions, uh, in, in workplaces, that might actually conflict with a lot of things. So one example of that in the United States was during the civil, just before the civil rights era, is that the unions were actually one of the most regressive institutions keeping blacks out of uh, a lot of jobs. So, so certainly those things can happen, do happen. In the case of, uh, in the, case of the US civil rights, uh, you know, the civil rights movement was much stronger than the unions, so that sort of uh, uh, got resolved but through a variety of presidential decrees and, 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 and then laws. But, but, but it could certainly happen again, and, 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 and if it does happen, and especially in a lot of places, I think uh, this, this, there, is, there is a possibility that rights of minorities of all sorts, religious, ethnic, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and sexual, might actually, in, in, uh, might actually contradict with political rights, because as political rights become more widespread, there might be uh, parties that get a lot of support wanting to repress these minorities. And uh, so, so that's certainly not off the cards. Uh, you know, my optimism doesn't extend to saying that that's not going to happen, but but my hope is that it's going to happen to only a limited degree. One more, please. Uh, my question is for Dr. General. So uh, there's a rapid advancement in robotics and technology. There's also I'm actually can sorry, you I'm speak not, up? I'm here, having a hard time hearing. Uh, so there is a rapid advancement. Robotics and automation. There is also the uh, overpopulation, population explosion. So I'm thinking 100 years down the line, there will be a much higher capacity for production. But not really uh, 
matching you for uh, human labor of the ordinary person of skill, right? So what are the economic and political um, implications of that? Excellent question. So let me first start by agreeing with you that uh, I think a lot of what we know uh, on what's coming down the line in terms of technologies and a lot of what we can project is absolutely along the lines of what you're saying. Med improvements in uh, robotics and improvements in uh, uh, computer-assisted uh, machinery that is going to be able to replace a lot of human tasks. But let me take a little parenthesis and say I mentioned Keynes. Uh, Keynes' essay was, was a big failure. In, well, no, I it was partial failure. The biggest prediction that he made, actually, was that exactly what you touched on. He said that because of technological improvements in, uh, in, in 80 years' time, we would be working only five hours and or there will be widespread technological unemployment. And, uh, and, and, and that, that turned out to be wrong, despite the fact that he did not see, he did not foresee the robotics. So in fact, the robotics improvements that we've already experienced over the last 30 years should have added to that. And I think there are two reasons, uh, there are three reasons why that's not, you know, uh, it's, a, it's not a done deal that uh, these improvements in the machinery uh, uh, that replaces human tasks will lead to human unemployment. I think one of them is exactly what Kemal mentioned, is that you actually create jobs in other sectors as you, do, uh, as you, as you reduce jobs in some sectors. The second one is sort of a, a, an elaboration on that in some sense, is that the, the patterns that I showed you actually is that there are uh, many occupations that are growing very rapidly. So in particular, there are many occupations in which hu uh, humans are really necessary. One of them is, uh, is a broad set of occupations you can call design. The more uh, machines are important in performing tasks, you need the more you need people to design them to do exactly what they should do. And the second set of occupations that I highlighted there were all sorts of service occupations. So as we actually improve the standards to which we can manufacture things, we will need more and more people to service a lot of uh, a variety of needs from retail to uh, home care to health technology and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then the third one is that, uh, and here I sort of partly agree with what you've said, but, but with a caveat is that actually what I think many of these technologies will do is that they are going to reduce the demand for certain types of labor. And so the first order effect of that is going to be actually distributional. It's, there's no necessity that if the demand for certain types of labor goes down that these people will be unemployed because their wages can fall. And as their wages fall, then, the, then other occupations that can employ them can expand. And that's essentially what happened to the service occupations. So the wages of service occupations have generally fallen relative to design occupations, but employment has increased because of that wage fall. So I think the question that, you know, uh, that you're, you're asking can be best answered by saying that there will be a variety of pressures for increasing inequality by reducing pay at the bottom of the uh, wage distribution in the United States and in other OECD countries. And then how we deal with those, for example, by <coughs> reducing uh, the ability of wages to fall or by increasing the human capital of these workers is going to show whether we will actually let this problem translate into an unemployment problem or whether we're going to be able to deal with it uh, with limited unemployment and with, with limited uh, increases in inequality. 